but we're very happy to present um, Native American stories, which is just uh, not meant to be comprehensive, but just a few things that uh, we enjoyed or that we've heard about or, or seen coming out. Um, and I think it's appropriate. I've seen uh, many people advertise that it's uh, Indigenous Peoples Month. Um, and in fact, uh, I used this graphic here uh, earlier uh, this week when I logged into Google, they had it. And I thought, well, I, I just uh, use that um, and share that uh, for the opening slide. Uh, Nancy, uh, maybe you want to talk about this slide for me? Right. Um, the preferred term, how do you refer to Native American people, Indian, Indigenous people? Um, natives, and I was wondering about this because I know in the library card catalog it's called Indians of North America, and not that the Library of Congress is on the cutting edge of, of terminology. They're usually a few decades behind, but I went to the National Museum of the American Indian website, and they had a whole page on this, and this is the quote that I, I put on here. Um, they're all acceptable and often used interchangeably. If you are uh, talking to a Native American person, they suggest that you ask what term they prefer because there is a wide um, disparity of opinions. And in fact, I was surprised to read that Native American is kind of going out of style, which surprised me. Um, so that's just to throw in a little bit about terminology because we may use them interchangeably here, although I think we're intending to use the word Native American. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was happy that Nancy uh, reminded me the M Museum of the American Indian is a great um, place to visit in Lower Manhattan near Battery Park. It's free. Um, and um, I've taken my kids there. They have a part in the basement uh, for children. I think when my son was uh, researching a project uh, we happen to go down there and and um, in any case it, it's a great uh, place to visit and, and learn more. Okay I guess I'll begin. These are books that uh, are coming out or that you should be aware of. I, uh, I'm sure that everyone here has heard of Louise Urgent. She's one of the best writers in the world today. She happens to be a uh, Chippewa uh, no, I'm sorry, she's not Chippewa, she's Ojib Ojibwe. And uh, she wrote the, she won the Nat Pulitzer Prize for this book, The Night Watchman, in 2021. And she's got a new book coming out called The Sentence, uh, which will be out shortly. Uh, the, the, the premise of this book is based on her grandfather, who was a Chippewa and a Night Watchman. And he tried to force the federal government to honor the treaties that they had made with Native people. And as I'm sure you all know, those treaties were more often than not just uh, forgotten. They, didn't, they were not honored at all. And in this book, she tells a personal story, but also a story of her people that not getting what they were promised and being stuck on some land that the only reason they got it was because white people didn't want it. It was unarable land or a desert or it had, it was difficult to live on. And, and I think even today, if you go to some of the reservations, you'll see what they got stuck with. So um, if you haven't read this book or any of her books, she's a wonderful writer. I really recommend her. Okay, uh, what do we have next? Oh, now, I'm kind of embarrassed to say I was not familiar with the poet laureate of the United States, who's Joe Harjo. And she's the first Native American poet laureate of the United States. She's a member of the Muskegee or Creek Nation. I was talking to one of the librarians just before, and she buys some poetry books for the library, and she was raving about Joe Harjo. And she was making, um, she said that she's also edited a lot of books about Native American poetry. And she's a very accomplished woman. She's done many literary uh, achievements. So I think I will be reading some of her poetry. And I, I would recommend that you try her, too. Okay, so that's Joe Harjo. 
Oh, The Taking of Jemima Boone by Matthew Pearl. I don't know if anyone has read anything by Matthew Pearl. He's a, a novelist. He writes mostly historical fiction. Um, he decided to write a nonfiction book about this um, incident with Jemima Boone, who was the daughter of Daniel Boone. And it's a true story. She and her two friends were out canoeing and they were kidnapped by these men who felt that they had not been treated fairly by Daniel Boone and the other settlers who were coming into Kentucky and taking away their hunting land, uh, land that they considered almost sacred because it was such a rich hunting ground for them. So they were going to use her as a bargaining chip to try and get and get them to leave, get them to leave Kentucky. Um, after three days, Jemima and her uh, two friends were rescued by Daniel Boone. Um, Daniel Boone, I think, has a bad reputation as like that he was at the Alamo. He wasn't. He, had, he was dead by then. But he's uh, even though he was a settler and he was an explorer. He was not a bloodthirsty man. He really, when his own son was killed by Native Americans, he refused to go after them. He refused to be vengeful. So that's one thing in his favor, because one of the things you get from reading this book is the revenge that just went on and on. It never seemed to stop. You, If your side was killed, you, you took it, you killed the other side and tortured and scalped and there's a lot of bloodthirsty um, warfare going on. So uh, I would recommend this book. I hadn't finished it when I read, when I wrote the slide, but I just finished it. And it's quite a good story. It, as he's a novelist, he writes a very uh, entertaining and, you know, well-paced uh, tale. So give this a try. It's a new book. I had started reading it, and uh, Nancy, and mm -hmm. didn't he say in the introduction, I just got to the part where they were kidnapped, and then they're yeah. talking about the other side, but didn't he say in the introduction that um, James Fenimore Cooper had used this story as yes. an inspiration for, for what? Yes, he did, because it was a kind of a, a, not folklore, I mean, this was a real incident, but it was, there were a lot of, and this book talks about some of the kidnapping of young white women or young white men by Native Americans. And he based the kidnapping in the Blast of the Mohicans on Jemima Boone's kidnapping. Um, and so he does bring up some other anecdotes, Mary Jemison, people who stayed, who never wanted to come back. And, they, and so it's kind of an interesting, um, phenomena that when you like I don't know if it's called the uh, Stockholm syndrome where you you stay with your captors and they become your family and you forget English you forget your name you forget your family um Shimano was only gone three days so there was no danger of that she she in fact later on married one of her rescuers when she was 14 um because the people were very gung-ho on getting the, the girls back no spoilers, Nancy. No spoilers. Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. When Two Feathers Fell from the Sky, um, this is by Margaret Verbal, and I had actually seen her on a webinar talking about this book, and it really interested me. Um, she is a, a published author. She's written other books. She's a member of the Cherokee Nation, and this book has a very interesting premise. Um, Two Feathers is a Cherokee horse diver. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Like, I think in Atlantic City, on a steel pier, they would have a famous diving horse. You know, they'd have a rider and they would dive into a body of water. And it was very thrilling to watch. And that's what this young woman does. Um, so it does talk about her culture, her heritage, which is a little muddied at some point because she's, she's She's kind of an orphan, and she doesn't really know her antecedents very well. And then um, there's a mystery in it. So I think this sounds like a really fun, interesting book. And the fact that it's written by um, a Cherokee writer about a Cherokee character, I think, gives it a little bit more um, resonance. Because we didn't often see books written by um, authors who were that nationality. Oh, this is yours. Oh, uh, The Removed. Nancy had actually talked about this book. Oh, uh, yeah. 
in a previous uh, session about you know what was coming out. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I think it came to you because Tommy Orange, who we'll talk about in a second, um, had recommended it. And um, again, it's another book written by uh, a Native American about Native Americans. And what happens is uh, a, the son dies and um, he was shot by the police. And so it's kind of reminding me of all these things that have happened in the last year or so uh, that we've seen play out. Um, but then that day is relived and, and uh, remembered. Um, and so, and then there are connections, of course, with uh, Native American history. And uh, it's really kind of sad. I always joke with Nancy. I like sad books. <laughs> no happy books. Um, in the future, we've promised to do a, a yeah. The series on just happy books, but not not here. Not yet. <laughs> uh, this is a new nonfiction book. Um, Colin Calloway has written a number of books on uh, Native Americans. And I think the premise of this is interesting um, in that we often think of the Native Americans in the wilderness or, um, you know, uh, and in, in, in this book, he talks about uh, Native Americans in cities, in colonial cities in 17th and 18th century and kind of documents that. And um, kind of an interesting way to look at things um, if you um, think about, um, Again, referring to Tommy Orange, um, talks about Native Americans in the city, but in the 21st century in his novel. Um, but anyway, that's uh, one of the latest uh, books on Native Americans, kind of an academic study in our nonfiction section. Um, probably one of the more well-received books on um, Native Americans in the last few years is David Truer's Heart beat of wounded knee. Um, unlike Callaway, he is a uh, Native American um, and he grew up on a reservation in Minnesota, but he's also trained as an anthropologist. Truer also writes fiction. Um, so he has a personal experience with it, um, but he also has an academic understanding. And in addition, um, he's also a writer of fiction. So all of those things together, um, including the fact that he uh, blends some memoir into it, uh, make this for uh, a good book to check out um, on the nonfiction side of things. So now we're going to talk about some books that we've read um, and that we recommend. And I keep talking about Tommy Orange, but this is really uh, one of my favorite books of the last few years, an excellent book. And uh, we have many copies at the library, um, so it shouldn't be difficult to find. Um, and he starts this book out in a prologue. And um, I just want to read a little bit from the prologue. But the prologue uh, is kind of a series of very short essays strung together and um, and he's kind of laying it all on the line they're they're kind of the book is a novel um, but these essays are really about um, Native American people different uh, atrocities committed against them uh, etc and he, he's really kind of hitting hard but at the end he's also talking and and now this is where it transitions into uh, the novel, he's talking about the urban um, Indian. Uh, and he says, urban Indians were the generation born in the city. We've been moving for a long time, but the land moves with you like memory. An urban Indian belongs to the city and cities belong to the earth. Everything here is formed in relation to every other living and non 
living thing from the earth. And he goes on uh, to say, we know the sound of the freeway better than we do the rivers, the howl of distant trains better than wolf howls. We know the smell of gas and freshly wet concrete and burned rubber better than we do the smell of cedar or sage or even fry bread, which isn't traditional, like reservations aren't traditional, but nothing is original. Everything comes from something that came before, which was once nothing. Everything is new and doomed. We ride buses, trains, and cars across, over, and under concrete plains. Being Indian has never been about returning to the land. The land is everywhere or nowhere. And then it, it launches in, and all of these characters, their lives are seemingly unconnected at first, but then they all begin to connect um, at, at the end. Um, so... I, I can't, if I had to just say, read one book when we leave today, uh, this would be mine. Although I am very, uh, The Night Watchman sounded very good as well. Now, in terms of a nonfiction book, if I had to recommend one nonfiction book, this Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, it will be released as a film and so it will get a lot of press because Leonardo DiCaprio is in it, Robert De Niro is in it, um, among others, and um, Martin Scorsese directs. So you are going to be hearing more about this uh, book and film. So now's the time to read the book before you see the uh, film. And because uh, we always know the book is, is almost always better. And, um, and uh, Nancy was talking earlier about how often um, the Native Americans would lose their land and they were always given the worst land, et cetera. Uh, but in this case, uh, they were giving land, given land which they thought was, which those giving it to them thought was worthless, but they found oil there. And so oil meant money, and money uh, turned into murders, and uh, David Grant is an excellent author, um, and so it's a real page turner. Uh, right, I think I read this right before the pandemic hit, uh, COVID, or it might have been in the early days of it. I had, uh, this is like uh, the last book I checked out you know, before we closed up shop for a few months there. Uh, or maybe I read it, the digital book. In any case, it's a great book and it reminded me of Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, but Killers of the Flower Moon is set in the early, I believe the early 20th century, isn't it, Nancy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is set in contemporary times uh, in the Dakotas and um, again, natural resources, oil, people are being murdered. Uh, and this woman known as Yellowbird uh, wants to find out who's doing it. And Sierra Crane Murdoch, the author kind of inserts herself in a way, as you see in many uh, memoirs and nonfiction books. Now the, the authors become part of the story, not just storytellers, um, um, but it's a very, uh, interesting book. If you read Killers of the Flower Moon and you like it, uh, read this one to go along with it. And uh, we have lots of um, people or maybe ask us at the library or maybe you may just be wondering, um, what about the local Native Americans? Because certainly we have lots of names. Uh, that are Native American around here. Nyack is one, probably the most obvious one uh, you could think of, or uh, Muncie, uh, again, Native American, Ramapo. Um, all of these are we get from uh, the Native Americans. So this book is a book that talks about the Algonquian people, which is a larger um, language group, I guess, is what you would say. And then it, it dives down deeper and it has a great chart. I'll never forget um, 
the chart where you, when you think of Algonquian people and then underneath that you have groups and then further down you have tribes, clans, um, but it has a great chart that kind of organizes organizes that off and shows you um, where the local people um, fit in. Uh, now, Nancy mentioned Forget the Alamo. Now, this is not really a book, a Native American uh, book, but it's kind of the latest nonfiction book I read. It's gotten a lot of press in Texas. I think it's banned. <laughs> probably banned in Texas schools, but um, probably by a bunch of people who never read it, because um, it's a really great work of historiography uh, about the Alamo, which in essence is a book um, that tells uh, all the ways that the history was written. So, um, and it, uh, with, with an eye towards getting to what really happened there, and uh, part of that is the story of uh, the indigenous people who uh, participated on um, on either side <laughs> is um, kind of misrepresented or or uh, not told at all. Um, and and so, if you want to dive into a, a banned book, um, forget the Alamo is my favorite. <laughs> banned in Texas, not in New York. No. <laughs> um, and since we're talking about um, kind of the southern United States and you have, uh, you know, who who is a Native American? Who is, uh, I guess, um, it reminded me of this book, uh, Autobiography of a Brown Buffalo, which is kind of a wild ride, <laughs> is what I would say. If, if you're familiar with Hunter S. Thompson's book, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, he is a lawyer who he calls Samoan. Well, again, the uh, Native Americans are kind of written off. He wasn't Samoan. He was, uh, in fact, his parents were from uh, Mexico. And he, this is his kind of fictionalized memoir in a sense. Um, uh, interestingly enough, the real Costa disappeared and was either, depending on who you talk to, either the victim of uh, political assassination or uh, perhaps was um, uh, on the wrong end of a drug deal gone bad in Mexico. Okay. Nancy? Oh, yeah. This book um, is by Geraldine Brooks, Caleb's Crossing. She's Australian. And uh, I read this book many years ago, but it stayed with me. Um, this takes place during colonial times. And uh, this young woman, Bethia, her father's a minister, and he's trying to convert the Native Americans there to Christianity and civilize them. So there's this one young man who's the chief's son, and he's very promising, he's very bright. So he gives him tutoring. The young man gets into Harvard. Um, he wears white man's clothes. And instead of him being a bridge between the cultures, he's, he's not treated as a white man. He's, they're trying to turn him into a white man to make him better and to leave his um, Native American ways behind. And I don't know if it struck me so much when I read it years ago, but it just now I, I, it's so cr cringy that they would actually make someone be different and make them improve them by being making them white and i think a lot of missionaries and white settlers thought that they were bringing something better to the native americans and that's kind of the thing that i accepted over the many years i'm old and and that's how i looked at it is that you know, civilization they were being civilized they were being you know brought into christianity into a white culture never thinking about what they were leaving behind and what they didn't want to leave behind. And this, I think, is probably a story that was repeated many times um, in our culture. And this is based on a true story in Martha's Vineyard. And as I said, it's been many years since I read it, but I think the injustice of this book stayed with me over the years. So I love Geraldine Brooks's work. So 
she writes many different kinds of fiction and um, she was married to Anthony Horowitz who writes nonfiction. Unfortunately, he passed away very suddenly a few years ago. Um, he also took kind of an anthropolo anthropological look at the South specifically and different cultures and how um, and he was just such a great writer. And I'm sorry for Geraldine Brooks losing her husband. And I don't know if she's writing anything at the moment, but uh, I hope she will come out with something again. I'll write Horowitz, who wrote Confederates in the Attic. Yeah, very funny book. Wow. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I was reading his book when he died, and I can't remember the name of it, but I was saddened because he wasn't very old. He was, I think, in his 40s. And... Tony Horowitz, so, yeah. Yeah, so I really like this book, and I think if you look at things from a different point of view, sometimes if you reread something, and you say, why didn't this bother me when I read it the first time? And um, I think that, she, you know, she was making a point and I, I might not have gotten it, but I get it now. So I recommend this book and anything by her. This book, um, The Broken Chord by Michael Doris, I read this again many, many years ago. And um, Michael Doris was a very excellent writer. He actually killed himself. Um, he was married to Louise Erdrich and they were separated and he was having a lot of personal issues and he, he killed himself. But he had written a lot of books uh, about Columbus before Columbus. In this book, this is his own story. He was a graduate student. He was aware of his Native American heritage, but he had not really thought about it too much. But now that he was became a anthropological graduate student, he became more interested in his culture. He adopted a young boy, a Native American boy, and in the beginning of the book, the boy's behavior is really wild, and he doesn't know what to do. And then he's finally, the young boy is, is uh, diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome. And the author really decides to do a little in-depth study of how prevalent this is on reservations and among um, Native Americans, and it, it was an epidemic. There were, there were so many people who were affected by this disease, and it, it's a terrible syndrome because you don't get better. The damage is done, and um, the story of him raising this boy is, is heartbreaking um, because it's not just his culture, his, it's his own son who is affected by this. It's a very, very sad book, uh, but it does bring to light um, a terrible problem which is really kind of still going on um, on the reservations today with poverty and drugs and alcohol. And, uh, you know, so I think this was the first book that made me aware that something was wrong. Um, we don't have a copy of it, but we could get you one. <laughs> okay. Um, Earlier today, we were talking to the young adult librarian, Mary Phillips, and she recommended two books to us. Now, even though they're both young adults, that shouldn't be a, a deterrent to reading the books because this one is a biography, Apple Skin to the Core by Eric L. Gansworth. Um, this book is really a treat visually. It's got all sorts of, it's got graph, graphics, it's got black and white photos. Uh, it's written in verse. But uh, it's the, what the title means is the slur apple means someone is red on the outside and white on the inside. And I think we've seen similar kinds of um, slurs for other people. But he explores in this book all the racism uh, that he's faced. He's an artist. He's gay. He has a lot of uh, world he's got to kind of uh, maintain and uh, this is highly recommended by Mary Phillips, and it sounds like a really great book. In fact, she said she was kind of surprised it was put in YA because it's more of an adult story. But I think if anyone wants to see what it was like for a person growing up, you know, in the situation, this is a really good book to get a hold of. Um, and it was a national book, long-listed for the National Book Award. So, but, you know, it's something we should not forget about. This is another one recommended by Mary, um, Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Gooley. Um, this is about a young young woman who's, her mother's white, her father who's deceased, 
it's an Spanish um, It's really a thriller, uh, but she's looking to, she wants to become a doctor and she wants to go to college. And um, she has to take time while to take care of a family member. While she's staying at home, she, she sees that the, uh, there's a meth lab and a meth epidemic hitting um, people in her nation. And uh, she, so she tries to get to the bottom of it. So there's that thriller aspect. But it's also her struggle to find a place for herself in the world, try and reconcile these two world that she lives in and uh, it sounds really wonderful so I think you know even though it's a young character it's a young woman I don't think that should stop you from reading this book it really uh, I think that there are a lot of really great YA books and the only reason they're probably in YA is because the character is young you know it's a teenager so other than that I think this um, would probably be a great adult book to read Okay, oh, okay, this is... So what of local Native Americans? So uh, every once in a while, we'll get a request. And they will, we know there's a group of Native... Aren't, aren't there a group of Native Americans in, in, out in Western Rockland or the Ramapo? What is that all about? So here, uh, there's an author I can recommend who's an archaeologist, Edward J. Lenick, who's written a number of books recently. Some of the other books that uh, traditionally uh, people referred to are, are really fallen out of favor. The authors, um, the Ramapo people say that um, it's based on folklore and lies. Um, and I've learned some things myself that make me not think that that is some of those other books are good to recommend, but Lenick, I think, is safe. He's an he's a established archaeologist, um, and so if you want to know more about the Ramapo, his books are a good source. Generally, about Native Americans in the Hudson Valley, uh, Julian Salomon's book, Indians of the Lower Hudson Region, uh, the Muncie, is also a good source, even though it's older. Um, Furthermore, there's a couple films on the native, uh, on the Ramapo, really great films. Uh, American Native from 2014 um, it deals a lot about, um, you know, identity. A lot of these these books that um, we talked about, a lot of the modern books. Um, uh, even the last young adult book Nancy was talking about, what you're talking about is people struggling um, with their identity. And there are a couple, um, lots of interviews with Chief Perry in this. And he he talks about that. And there are a few things that he said um, that kind of stuck with me. One of them is that um, Indians are, are the, uh, you know, the only people that, they live, it's like they're stuck in time. I said to Nancy today, I said, um, it's like if we were talking about, you know, our uh, Irish or English or Polish or Russian uh, people, we wouldn't show up wearing the clothes that they wore 150 or 200 years ago. We would just show up. But it's like because you're Native American, they're supposed to have this you know, wear headdresses and live in longhouses. And that's just not true. And so you really see that in that film. Um, you know, kids are going to the prom and they're Ramapo. And I just think that they're, uh, it was really an interesting part of Rockland history and culture uh, that um, the Ramapo are here. And there's lots of patrons who even come into the library who said, uh, when we've talked about these things and had these types of programs said, oh yes. Um, you know, my people are Ramapo. Uh, the other one is Man versus Ford, which deals with the pollution um, from the, I believe, uh, I don't want to say which corporation it is. I think I just, in there. A, let's say a car company in Mawa. Who incidentally named. <laughs> who will go unnamed, who polluted um, very heavily there. Um, and there's also a book, which I didn't list here, but it's uh, Chuck Stead, 
Get the Let Out, um, who talks about growing up in Western Rockland and some of the things he saw with pollution and um, becoming friends with uh, some of the Rampo people, uh, people from the Rampo Nation. And uh, that's a good book to check out too. Not too many libraries have that, but we have a Chuck Stead Get the Let Out. Uh, felt like I understood a lot more after reading that. And so that's all we had today, but uh, Nancy, do you want to talk about some of these different resources? Oh, yes. Well, I always like to mention when we do these about how you can find out books, either books that we've talked about, books that sound like you'd be interested in. And we do have on our database page, uh, we have under literature, uh, you can look at um, a few things, book browse or novelist. And if you put in certain terms, it will help you find different books. Um, so if you go to e-library, and then um, databases and research, click on literature. And then the first one that up is uh, book browse, uh, novelist, novelist K, that's for kids, but of course that's certainly something you'd use. The other ones are more for if you're writing a paper, but for finding something to read, Novelist Plus and Book Browse are excellent. You can put in a term or a subject, a genre, and it will find books on a subject. It does read alikes. If you did read there, there, you want something that's like that, you can put that title in it. It will find you some other titles or other authors that you might enjoy. So that's a good way to find something to read if you can't get in touch with us. Oh, look, book club discussion um, is when two feathers fell from the sky. Um, that's a coincidence. I didn't know that. Um, you can also um, get a lot of... What's nice about book browse is that it gives you an idea. Sometimes it gives you a summary, excerpt, reading guide, and it helps you decide if that's something you might want to read. Spoiler alert. Yeah, so don't read that. <laughs> 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 Close your eyes. Um, and the novelist, this has a limited amount of books because they don't give you everything. They give you what they consider the best. They're a little bit more snobbish when it comes to books. They're not going to have a James Patterson or a Daniel Steele in there. Novelist, um, you know, you would... Uh, That's why it's helpful to be away from the library. It shows you shows people what it's like to log in from home. Yes, it's true. And here they have, along the left side, they have different genres, uh, fiction A to Z for fans of, if you're looking for historical fiction. Um, they also have nonfiction too, so, um, which is a nice thing. So they're there if you want to see what book is like that. It gives you a bunch of stuff. It gives you the authors. It gives you a little bit about the book. Erdrich, Hobson, yeah. some of yeah. the authors that we've talked about. Right. So that's a nice, that's a very nice tool for people. Uh, sometimes you can get really stuck. You just don't know what you want to read next. And if we're not around to help you if you're home and you, you don't, you just want to, if you, for some reason you don't want to come into a library, but you want to get some advice, you can get advice from them <laughs> or us. Uh, so this is two nice, two nice tools that I think everyone should be aware of and use because they're they're really helpful and they're very eye opening. You'll find a lot of stuff to read that you didn't even know was out there. You don't have to read off the bestseller list. <laughs>